And we are back for our second video on the determinant. In the first, we discussed the geometric meaning of the determinant. Then we derived a number of its important properties. And finally, we learned how to compute the determinant in a few very special cases. Today, we will learn how to compute the determinant of any square matrix. Before we get started, I want to remind you of a few key facts from the last video. First, we saw why the determinant of a product is the product of the determinants. And this was in fact obvious if you think about the geometric meaning of the determinant and the geometric meaning of matrix multiplication. And in an exercise in the book, you showed that this extends to a product of any number of matrices. For example, if we had the determinant of ABC, that would be equal equal to the determinant of A times the determinant of B times the determinant of C. And this would hold even if we had a product of 500 matrices here. We would just end up with 500 factors on the other side. This, as we see, will be very important to us in today's lecture. We also proved that the determinant of a triangular matrix is simply the product of the entries on the main diagonal. And the third key fact from last time that we will need is that the determinant of any shear matrix will be one because shears preserve volume and orientation. If you need to review any of this stuff, you know where to look. As for today, keep your eyes open for the appearances of all three of these facts. Now, now, let's get to work. I'm going to begin by introducing a new, very simple kind of matrix. An elementary matrix is one that can be obtained from the identity matrix by doing one row operation. So let's consider some examples. We'll start with the identity matrix. I'm going to use the 3x3 three three version, though any would do. And now we will think about these sorts of things we would get if we were to apply one row operation to it. Well, let's see. We could apply a row swap. To be definite, let's say that we swap rows 1 and 2, which will give us this. Now, we obtained this matrix from the identity matrix using just one row operation, so it is an elementary matrix. Oh, and to be clear, when I say doing one row operation, I mean by doing one of the three row operations one time. Anyway, our second row operation is to scale a row, and let's say that we scale the middle row by some constant c, so that we end up with this. That would be another example of an elementary matrix. And finally, our third row operation, where we add or subtract a scaled row to another, like here I'll add k copies of row 1 to row 3, leads to another kind of elementary matrix. Okay, so the definition of an elementary matrix is simple enough, but why should we care about these things? Well, let me describe very briefly how they are going to help us. We will have a lot of details to work out, but I want to give you a high-level overview so you know where we are headed. Our goal, of course, is to come up with a method to compute the determinant of any old square matrix A. What we will see is that there is always going to be a way to take our matrix A and multiply it on the left by a sequence of elementary matrices so that the result will be a triangular matrix, which I'm calling T here. What we can do then is take the determinant of both sides and we will get some very nice results because on the left we have the determinant of a product. And as I reminded you a moment ago, the determinant of a product is the product of the determinants. And what we will soon see is that all elementary matrices have determinants that we can figure out just by thinking geometrically. That means that all of these individual factors, these determinants of elementary matrices, are things that we know. Moreover, on the right-hand side, we have the determinant of a triangular matrix. And of course, we know how to compute that. So in this equation, we only have one unknown factor, and that is the very thing that we want, the determinant of A. So we can now just solve for it. The determinant of A will be the determinant of that triangular matrix divided by the product of the determinants of all those elementary matrices. And as I said, these are all computable. These are things we know already, or will know very soon. That is where we are headed. Good. And if this sounds like a terribly complicated procedure to carry out, you should know that one, in practice, with large matrices, of course it's done on a computer. And two, we will find a very simple way to automate it so that we're not actually carrying out this gargantuan matrix multiplication. I hope this roadmap 
gives you a sense of where we're headed. And now you understand our overall strategy for coming up with our method for computing determinants. Now we need to get down to some of the details. And the first thing we need to do is to discuss the determinants of elementary matrices. The determinant of an elementary matrix will depend upon which row operation we used to get to it from the identity matrix. Let's start at the bottom and work our way up. If we obtained our elementary matrix from the identity matrix by adding a scaled row to another, then we end up with something that looks almost exactly like the identity matrix, except one column will have been tampered with. One of its zeros will no longer be zero. It will be some other constant. And as we learned last time, a matrix with that shape represents a shear. We devoted a good portion of the previous video to explaining why that is so. And as I reminded you at the beginning of this video, the determinant of any shear matrix is 1, since shears preserve volume and orientation. Ah, interesting. All right, good. Let's move up to the next type of elementary matrix, which we get by scaling a row by some constant C. Well, when we do that, the result is a triangular matrix. We could consider it an upper triangular matrix because everything below the main diagonal is a zero. It happens also to be a lower triangular matrix as well. And that being so, we know that its determinant is the product of its diagonal entries. So that would just be C, the scaling factor, because the diagonal entries would be C and then a bunch of ones. Two here because we're working with three by three matrices. But if we were working with 10 by 10 matrices, we would have C and then nine ones. By the way, what does this elementary matrix do geometrically? Well, what does it do to the standard basis vectors? We can read that off of the columns of the matrix. And so we see that our map is going to scale one of those standard basis vectors while the others remain fixed. They were all initially unit length, but now one of them has length C. So whereas we originally would have had a grid of unit cubes, now we will have a grid of rectangular boxes, one by one by C boxes. So the geometric operation here is a stretch along one axis by a factor of C. Each unit of volume now becomes C units of volume. So the magnitude of the determinant will be C. And note that if C was negative, in other words, if we had scaled a row by a negative, then this vector would be on the other side, meaning that in the transformation, it passes through the span of the other vectors so that we get an orientation reversal, which means that the determinant would be negative, which is exactly what we would expect. Good. So that was just another geometric way of seeing why the determinant here would be C. And finally, our third type of elementary matrix, which was obtained from the identity matrix by swapping two rows, well, what sort of map would that be? What does it do geometrically? Well, let's think about it. When you swap two rows in the identity matrix, the effect is the same as if you had swapped the corresponding columns. So we swapped the first two rows, yielding this matrix. But of course, if we had swapped the first two columns, the result would look the same, thanks to the simple symmetry of our identity matrix. And if we think about it that way, it's a little easier to see what happens geometrically. Think about it not as swapping the rows, but as swapping the first two columns of our identity matrix, which means that geometrically speaking, we're just taking i hat and j hat and exchanging them, swapping their places while k hat remains fixed. Well, what we are doing there is in fact reflecting three-dimensional space in a plane, namely the plane that includes the fixed standard basis vector, k hat, but bisects that right angle between the two vectors that get swapped. So this kind of elementary matrix actually carries out a reflection. Now, if we were looking at, say, a two by two elementary matrix obtained by swapping the two rows of the two by two identity matrix, it would be a reflection in a line. If we looked at a four by four elementary matrix of this sort, it would be a reflection in a three dimensional hyperplane that contains the two fixed vectors and bisects the right angle between the two vectors that get swapped. But the details of the geometry don't particularly matter to us. What matters is that we recognize 
that this sort of elementary matrix represents a reflection. And the determinant of a reflection should be obvious because reflections do not change volume. They preserve volume. However, they obviously reverse orientation, which means that their determinants will be minus one. Good. We have made a lot of progress. Now we know the determinants of all kinds of elementary matrices. But in my overview of what we would be doing in this lecture, I told you that we would ultimately be able to start with a square matrix and left multiply it by a bunch of elementary matrices in such a way that the result would be a triangular matrix. And now you should be able to understand that if we can indeed do that, then we can come up with the determinant of A, as I outlined earlier, because we know the determinant of T, and we know the determinants of all the elementary matrices. But the last remaining piece in the puzzle, how on earth do we do that? How do we find a sequence of elementary matrices so that if I keep left multiplying A by them, I end up with a triangular matrix? That seems like magic. Oh, it's not magic. It comes from your old friend from chapter four, Gaussian elimination, because not only do elementary matrices come from row operations on the identity matrix, but we can actually use elementary matrices to do row operations. Let's say I have a matrix like this telephone matrix, and I do some row operation on it. Like let's say I subtract four copies of the first row from the second one. Well, we all know how that works. But I say unto you, we could get the same result by taking that matrix and instead of doing that row operation, multiplying that matrix on the left by the elementary matrix that corresponds to that row operation. In other words, if I start with the identity matrix and I subtract four times the first row from the second row, I get the elementary matrix whose rows are one, zero, zero, minus four one zero and zero zero one and i claim that if we carry out that multiplication we will get the exact same result that we got by doing the row operation i'll leave it to you to actually carry it out please do so and you will see now the connection between these two things a row operation and left multiplication by the corresponding elementary matrix the fact that they yield the same result is wonderful because it means anywhere we do a row operation we could instead do a matrix multiplication and you might say well why would i want to do matrix multiplication isn't it easier just to do the row operation yes it's easier to do the row operation if you're just carrying out a computation by hand but if we're talking about the theory the way this all works then the idea that i can take this kind of ad hoc operation and turn it into honest to God multiplication and get a real genuine equation out of this instead of this weird chicken scratch I've been doing up here. That's a huge improvement because once I have real equations in the picture, I can do all sorts of algebra, algebra that encodes all sorts of geometry. And we can understand how something like this mysterious thing would actually arise because each one of these left multiplications by an elementary matrix would simply correspond to a row operation. So that means if there's some way that I can start with a square matrix A and do a bunch of row operations to turn it into a triangular matrix, and certainly I can do that, because that's what we do when we put something in row echelon form. If I can do that, then I can just translate the corresponding row operations into elementary matrices, and I will know that I can get from my given square matrix to the triangular matrix by left multiplying by a bunch of elementary matrices. It's a very powerful idea. It clears this thing right up. And at this point, that roadmap I showed you a little while ago should be a lot clearer than it was. I promise I will do a concrete example of computing a determinant this way very soon. But before I do that, some of you may be wondering why this connection always works right here. Why is it that every row operation can be implemented by left multiplying by the appropriate elementary matrix? And part of me wants to just say, well, do a few examples, you get a feel for it, and you kind of come to understand it that way. And that's more or less what I do in the book. But in the video, what the hell, I'll show you a neat explanation of why that works. But I don't want to get too far afield, so I'm going to push that off until the end of this video. So stay tuned for that. But sticking to the main path for now, I want to begin down the path of showing you how we use these ideas to compute a determinant in practice. So let's say I have some matrix A, and I know that if I do enough row operations on it, 
I can turn it into some triangular matrix T. Just the usual Gaussian elimination business, but rather than going all the way to reduced row echelon form, we'll just stop whenever we reach a triangular matrix. Now I know that those row operations can be translated into left multiplications by elementary matrices. Let's say to be concrete that we needed seven row operations to turn our matrix into an upper triangular matrix. So that means I could have carried this out by starting with my matrix A, and the result of all that multiplication would be our triangular matrix T. Now we know that each elementary matrix corresponds to one of the row operations. Let's just say that the first and the third, which I've painted green, correspond to row swaps, and that the second and fifth, which I've painted blue, correspond to row scales. Let's say in this one we scale a row by a factor of a third, and in this one we scale a row by a factor of minus six. And let's say that the remaining three elementary matrices, which I've now painted yellow, correspond to adding a scaled row to another row. Now, we want the determinant of A, which we know is a factor of the determinant of the whole left side, since the determinant of a product is the product of the determinants. So let's take determinants of both sides of the equation and see what happens. Now on the left side, the determinant of the product is the product of the determinants. And let's see what that would be. Well, the determinant of E7, that's an elementary matrix corresponding to adding a scaled row to another row. We said those are shears, and therefore the determinant would be 1. The determinant of the next factor, well, that's an elementary matrix corresponding to the same operation. Geometrically, that's a shear, so its determinant is also 1. The determinant of the third factor, well, that corresponds to a row scale by minus 6, so the determinant is going to be minus 6. That's a stretch with a reflection. The fourth factor, well, that's another shear, so we get another 1. Then we have a row swap elementary matrix. Its determinant is minus 1. Then a row scale matrix by a factor of 1 third, so its determinant is a third. And finally, another row swap matrix whose determinant is minus 1, since it corresponds to a reflection. And then, of course, we have the unknown and much desired determinant of A. Now on the right hand side of the equation we have a triangular matrix and when we take its determinant we know all we have to do is take the product of its diagonal entries and let's say that that turns out to be minus 8 and now it's just arithmetic and we can solve for the determinant. I'm going to write this down though slightly tediously because it's going to help us see how this works in general. I'm not going to bother writing down all those factors of 1. Obviously they don't contribute anything. The two factors of minus 1 cancel out, but I'm still going to go ahead and write minus 1 squared for reasons you'll see in a moment. And then I've got my two scaling factors, minus 6 and a third. I'll go ahead and combine them into minus 2, the product of those scales. And when I multiply that with the determinant of A, we get minus 8. So dividing minus 8 by this junk, we get that the determinant of A is going to be, what's that going to be? 4. And that's that. Not so bad. But still, you may be thinking, yeah, it's not so bad when you don't include any of the details, but when you do it in practice, first you have to do the row reduction to get A to T. Then I have to keep track of those row operations. And for each row operation, I have to translate it into the appropriate elementary matrix. God, that's going to be a pain. Well, it's actually not that much of a pain, because you don't actually have to translate the row operations into elementary matrices. You just have to keep track of those row operations that really do contribute something to all this stuff we did down here. The row operation where we add or subtract a scaled row to or from another, that just produces factors of one. They don't do anything. And that's the most common row operation because that's how we zero out rows when we're doing Gaussian elimination. We just need to keep track of the row swaps, the ones I had in green, and the scales, which I had in blue. And let's think about how this works out in practice. Practice. So we reduce A to a triangular matrix T via row operations. What we need to do is to keep track of the number of row swaps, and I'll call that number S for swap, and the product of all the scaling factors, and I'll call that P for product. If we just bear those in mind, then as soon as we have done our row reduction to the triangular matrix, we can write down the determinant at once. Let's think about what it would be. So if we do all that, then what's the determinant of A going to be? Well, on the other side, we clearly get the determinant of T divided by some stuff, right? That's what we had down here. We had the determinant of T on the right-hand side, and then we just divided it by some stuff. So we're going to end up with the determinant of T over, well, now what's the stuff we have to divide by? That's the product of all those determinants of all those elementary matrices. We don't have to think about the ones that corresponded to adding a scaled row to another row. We just have to think about the other two kinds. Well, we know that S of them are row swaps. For each row swap, 
there's going to be a minus 1 on this side of the equation that we have to divide through. So we're going to get minus 1 to the power of s. So that'll either be a 1 or a minus 1, depending on whether there are an even or odd number of row swaps. But we also have to divide through by all those row scale factors. We take their product, like we did here, where we had minus 2, and divide through by that. So we're also dividing through by p, the product of all the scaling factors. And that is it. Now we have an algorithm for computing the determinant of any square matrix. And note that there's nothing in here about actually writing down those elementary matrices. That's all under the hood. That was the theory that allowed us to get here. But to carry it out, all we do is the usual reduction, and we just keep track of two things. So let's do a concrete example. If A is this 3x3 three three matrix, let's find its determinant. All right, so what do we do? We just need to reduce this thing down to a triangular matrix by doing row operations. So let's do it. As we row reduce this matrix, I will keep a running tally of the row swaps and a running product of the scale factors that we encounter along the way. Anyway, where to begin? Well, we'd like a 1 up here. I think the easiest way to do that would be to scale the second row by half and then swap the first two rows. So I'm going to go ahead and combine those steps. But before I do, I'll mark down in our tally, we're going to have our first row swap and our first scaling factor. When we do those two row operations, this matrix becomes this guy. Next, we'll zero out this first column in the usual way, obtaining this matrix. And notice that these two row operations do not contribute anything to our two tallies. Now we are aiming for a triangular matrix, and we're very close already. If we can get rid of that one down there, we'll have an upper triangular matrix. Well, to do that would be easy. First, let's scale the second row by one-fifth, like so. And of course, don't forget, we need to record that scaling factor. It goes into the product. So we had a half, and now we're multiplying it by the fifth. So our running total for the product is one-tenth. I need a little more room here, and with a wave of my magic wand, I have it. And now we just need to get rid of this one, turn it into a zero, which we can do by subtracting row two from row three, thus turning it into zero, zero, minus two. And we have finished the first part of our algorithm. We've reduced our original matrix to an upper triangular form. And as we did so, we kept track of the number of row swaps. There was only one at the beginning. And the product of scaling factors. Their product was a tenth. We therefore have enough information to compute the determinant of our original matrix. The determinant of A is a fraction where the top is the determinant of the triangular matrix we reduced it to. And of course, the determinant of this triangular matrix is the product of its diagonal entries, which is minus 2. But we have two factors we must divide by. First, for each row swap, we get a factor of minus 1. We only have one of those here. And then we also have to divide by the product of our scaling factors, which in this case is 1 tenth. Well, these two negatives cancel out, so we get 2 divided by a tenth, which is 2 times 10, better known as 20. And hallelujah, we have computed our first determinant that was not of some particular special form. And a mighty little volume magnifier this map is, blowing up volumes by a factor of 20 while preserving orientation. Good. Well, there are several other examples worked out in the book. They all work the same way, so I'm not going to bore you with more of those here. But I do have a few quick comments. First, this is not the only general algorithm for computing determinants. I present another one in the last section of Chapter 5 called cofactor expansion. I don't think I'm going to make a video about it, but it's another common one that you should know about. But this approach, computing determinants by row reduction, is much, much more computationally efficient than doing it by cofactor expansion, at least for large matrices, or even medium-sized matrices. Cofactor expansion is fine if you're working with relatively small matrices, maybe up to 5 by 5 or so. But beyond that, it just involves so many steps that your computer will be much happier if you program it to compute determinants this way than the other way. But you'll see it in good time when you get to that section in the book. Two other things you'll see in the book that I don't intend to go over in detail here. One, in the exercises, is that there is 
a quick formula specifically for getting determinants of 3x3 three three matrices, just like we've learned one for 2x2 two two matrices. The 3x3 three three matrix formula for determinants is a little more involved, but it's easy to use in practice once you get the hang of it. You'll see that in the exercises. There's also one other thing I do in this section of the book, which is that I prove an interesting theorem about the determinant of a transpose of a matrix. It turns out, surprisingly, that the determinant of the transpose of a matrix is equal to the determinant of the matrix itself. You would think that the transpose operation, changing all the columns into rows and vice versa, would be sufficiently radical that it would alter the determinant. But not so. Anyway, you can read the proof in the book. It uses many of the same ideas that we used to come up with this algorithm for computing determinants, and it is an occasionally useful fact in and of itself. But the proof is one of those things you get in the book and not in the videos. But in exchange, I'm going to show you something in this video to close it out that I don't discuss in the book. I want to return to that question of why it is that row operations can be carried out through left multiplication by their corresponding elementary matrices. There are different ways to explain this, but I'm going to show you a neat way that will introduce you to a third perspective on matrix-matrix multiplication. If you think back to chapter 3, when you first met the idea of matrix multiplication, you learned that it corresponds to the composition of linear maps, and then we learned two different perspectives on it, and I called the first one the column perspective on matrix multiplication. And the idea was that if you had two matrices that you were multiplying, then the column perspective tells you what the product is going to be on a column by column basis. For example, the first column of the product is determined by the left matrix and the first column of the right matrix. Namely, the first column in the product is the left matrix times the first column on that right matrix. So it reduces it to matrix vector multiplication. And the idea behind that, you will recall, is that the column consists of weights for the columns of the matrix on the left. And there was nothing special about the first columns here. If we wanted the 19th column of the product matrix, well, that would be the matrix on the left times the 19th column of the matrix on the right. In other words, that 19th column would be the weights that we attach to the columns of the matrix. And when we compute that weighted sum, we get the 19th column on the right. That was the column perspective. And when I introduced it, I mentioned that this one is very important for developing the theory of linear algebra, whereas the one we usually use to actually compute matrices, when we're doing computations by hand, for example, is what I called the entry perspective on matrix multiplication. And here the idea was that when we multiply two matrices to get their product, we can compute the product not on a column by column basis, but rather on an entry by entry basis. So for example, if we wanted to know specifically entry 37, meaning the third row and the seventh column of the product, the way we get that is by taking a dot product, namely of the third row of the left matrix and the seventh column of the right matrix. Their dot product gives us that particular entry. And we actually used the column perspective to explain why the entry perspective works. All right, and that's where we left it in chapter three. But it turns out that there is such a thing as the row perspective on matrix multiplication. And this is something that can be explained by the entry perspective. Although when I show it to you, you'll see it's similar in spirit to the column perspective. And here is how it works. As you will no doubt have guessed already, in this case, when we multiply our matrices together, the row perspective tells us what the product looks like on a row by row basis. And the idea is that if we want a particular row of the product, like let's say we want the first row, well, what we're going to need over here is kind of the mirror image of what we used in the column perspective. To get the first column, we used the entire left matrix and then the first column of the right matrix which served as weights for the columns of the left matrix. Well, to get the first row, now that everything is topsy-turvy, we're going to use the entire right matrix along with the first row of the left matrix. And the entries in this row will serve as weights for the rows of the right matrix. And I want to give you a quick example or two of how that works, but I'm going to need some space. So let me shrink the stuff with which we are already familiar. 
All right, so for our first example of using this row perspective, let's do this multiplication right here. I've got a two by four matrix on the left and a four by two matrix on the right. So I'm going to end up with a two by two matrix. Now, of course, you can do this matrix multiplication in the usual way, namely the entry perspective, but I want to show you what it would look like if we were to employ this row perspective to get the product matrix. And this looks like a pretty good candidate for it because the row perspective tends to be most useful when the left matrix in the product is fairly sparse, where there's lots of zeros and not too many non-zero entries. And as we work this example out, I think you'll see why that is something that makes this sort of multiplication easier. So let's see, row perspective. Let's come up with the first row of our product. Well, as we said, that is going to depend on the entire matrix on the right and just the first row of the matrix on the left. And specifically, this first row on the left consists of the weights we will attach to the various rows of the matrix on the right when we form a linear combination of those rows. So to get this first row in our product, we're going to take one copy of the first row on the right, no copies of the second row, no copies of the third row, and one copy of the fourth row. So altogether, we're getting one of these and one of these. And we put those two rows together, and their sum becomes the first row of our product, which is, of course, 8 10. Now, what about the second row of the product? Well, that comes from the entire matrix on the right and just the second row on the left, which consists of the weights that we will attach to the rows on the right. So in other words, we are going to get one copy of the first row plus two copies of the second row, plus no copies of the third row and no copies of the fourth row. So we get the first row plus twice the second row, which is going to be 7, 10, and we are done. And if you want, you could take a few moments and work out this multiplication using the entry perspective, or if you like, even the column perspective, and you'll see that you get, of course, the same result. This is no surprise, since this is just another perspective on the same phenomenon of matrix multiplication. The results had better be the same, no matter how we do it. So now that you've seen what this row perspective looks like in a concrete numerical case, I need to show you why I brought it up in the first place, which was to explain why row operations can be carried out through left multiplication by the row operations corresponding elementary matrices. And this is actually very easy to see once you understand this row perspective. So for example, let's start with the claim that scaling a row by a factor of C can be accomplished by left multiplying by the corresponding elementary matrix. And by that, you know what I mean. The elementary matrix that we obtain by multiplying the same row by C. So why is this so? Well, here's the simple explanation. Suppose we have some matrix, and let's call its rows R1, R2, R3, and R4. Obviously, this explanation is not just for the case where we have four rows in the matrix. And if I wanted to be very formal, I could say keep going until you get to row M or row N. But I'm not going to be that formal, because the more subscripts and parameters and so on and so forth we have running around, the less it becomes grounded in a very direct intuition. I'm going to trust that you will see that this explanation does not depend on having four rows, and that the same kind of explanation could be done if we have 19 rows or 107 rows or whatever you like. Anyway, let's get to it. We have such a matrix, and we're going to scale one of its rows by some factor C. I will choose to scale the second row, but again, any row would do. So when we do that, the result would be like this and our chosen row becomes, instead of R2, C times R2. Okay, that's a row scale. But what we want to do is, rather than just have this ad hoc operation, we want to get from the original matrix to the new matrix by means of a left multiplication by an appropriately chosen matrix, so that their product will be equal to the matrix we are aiming at. Okay, but how would I ever come up with such a matrix if this was a brand new idea to us? Well, if we were familiar with the row perspective on matrix 
matrix multiplication, it would be very easy to come up with such a matrix because in the row perspective, well, we're aiming to come up with for the first row in our product R1. And we're going to get there through this operation that involves everything in the right matrix and just the first row in the left matrix, whose entries will be the weights we attach to the rows on the right when we form a linear combination. So how do I form a linear combination of those four rows and come up with R1? Well, that's obvious. If our target is R1, well, we're going to take one copy of R1 and no copies of any of the other three rows. That means our weights should be 1, 0, 0, 0. We'll get one copy of row 1, none of 2, none of row 3, and none of row 4. The resulting linear combination is, of course, the first row here, which will be just R1. Well, that was easy. And if we wanted, say, the third row to come out to R3, which we do, we could do something similar. By our row perspective on matrix multiplication, we get that third row in the product through an operation involving the right matrix in its entirety and the third row of the left matrix, which consists of the weights we attach to the rows on the right. Well, what are those weights going to be? Obviously, we want no copies of the first row, no copies of the second row, one copy of the third row, and none of the fourth. Put them all together and we'll just get the third row. Therefore, the third row in our left matrix should be 0, 0, 1, 0. And by the same logic, we see what our fourth row should be. The weights we want there should be 0, 0, 0, 1. So that when we attach those weights to the rows of this right column, we get no R1s, no R2s, no R3s, and just one R4, which is what we were aiming at. So notice that the three rows of this 4x4 four four matrix that we've found are exactly the rows we would get if this were just the identity matrix. We still need to go in and fill in row two. What's that going to be? Well, now we're not just aiming at row two, we're aiming at C times row two. How do we accomplish that as a linear combination of these rows in the right matrix? Well, that's easy. We want no copies of R1, C copies of R2, no copies of R3, and no copies of R4. And we have done it. We have found a matrix that when we multiply our original matrix on the left by it, we get the matrix that we would have obtained by scaling the second row by C. And notice that this is exactly the corresponding elementary matrix, where we took the identity matrix and scaled its second second row by C. So yes, everything checks out in that case. And we could do the exact same thing with the other two row operations. Maybe I'll leave one of them to you. I'll leave the row swap to you. And we'll do claim two. Adding a scaled row to another row can be accomplished by left multiplying by the corresponding elementary matrix. So why does that work? Well, suppose we start with our matrix and we wanted to add K copies of row one to row three. Well, if we do that, nothing would change in rows 1, 2, and 4, but row 3 would become row 3 plus k copies of row 1. Okay, fine. But of course, our game here is to carry this out not by doing the row operation, but instead through left multiplication by the appropriate elementary matrix. Now let's see how we would design that matrix based on the row perspective, and we'll see that it matches up with the elementary matrix that you know it is actually going to be. Well, just like in the previous example, to get row 1, we just need to think of the weights over here for these rows. Now that's obvious. That's going to be 1, 0, 0, and 0, so that we get one copy of row 1 and none of rows 2, 3, and 4. Put those all together and you get row 1. Same story for R2, which means our row of weights in our left matrix will be 0, 1, 0, 0. And same story in R4, which has not changed either. So the weights in that fourth row will be 0, 0, 0, and 1. But what about the third row? Our target is row 3 plus k times row 1. Well, since these are the weights of those rows, we know exactly what they have to be. We want one copy of the third row and k copies of the first row. So our weights will be k, 0, 1, 0, so that we get k times row 1 and 1 times row 3, which is what we want. And according to the row perspective, this product is, of course, what we are aiming at. And moreover, this matrix on the left really is the one we said it should be, because this is the elementary matrix we get by taking the identity matrix and adding k copies of row 1 onto row 3. Good, so it works in that case too. And as I said before, I will leave the third case 
which has to do with swapping two rows to you. It's the exact same idea, of course. So what we have seen is that if this row perspective really works, then the claimed connection between row operations and left multiplication by elementary matrices also works. But does it work? I haven't actually explained why the row perspective itself is legitimate. I mean, the column perspective was legitimate because it came really from our definition of matrix multiplication as a way to encode the composition of linear maps. You can review that material if you don't remember why that is so. And the entry perspective is legitimate because it came from the column perspective. But I just announced the row perspective to you without explaining why it actually holds. But we should want to know, as always, why? Why does this work? And as is common throughout mathematics, there are several different ways you could explain why this holds. In fact, if you just play around with it for a little while, I think you'll be able to see that it can be explained from from the entry perspective. But that's one of those things that you play around with it, you figure out why it works, but actually nailing it down in words and symbols turns out to be quite ugly, and you end up, even if you do succeed in writing down an airtight formal proof, you end up with something where all the intuition has been drained away. So I'm going to show you a different proof. We're taking lots of back roads today on this video. I hope you enjoy the scenery. I'm going to show you a proof for the row perspective that depends on a little gadget that we have mentioned a few times times, but not done much with namely the transpose of a matrix. You first met it back in chapter three, where we said that if we have some matrix, then its transpose is a new matrix whose rows are the columns of the original matrix. So the transpose of this matrix would be this matrix. Again, all the transpose operation does is to exchange the columns with the rows and vice versa. And also back in chapter three in the exercises, I asked you to explain some simple algebraic properties of the transpose. Transpose. And I said something like, these sometimes come in handy. Well, this is going to be one of those occasions. One of the things I had you explain was that the transpose of a product is not quite the product of the transposes, or rather, it is the product of the transposes, but in the opposite order that you might expect. The transpose of AB is not transpose of A times transpose of B. It's the transpose of B times the transpose of A. The order of the factors gets swapped, and this apparently little curiosity is what I am going to use to explain why the row perspective on matrix multiplication works. So I will hide this property up in the corner and I will point to it in a few moments and say, see, see, that's what I'm using. All right, so let's get to our explanation of the row perspective. It might not surprise you too much that I'm going to lean on transposes since after all, we already have a column perspective and the row perspective is kind of like it. So maybe if we think of rows as columns and columns as rows, hmm, let's see. Well, anyway, let's suppose we have some matrix R, using R to stand for right. It's the matrix on the right in our product. And we multiply it on the left by some other matrix. And since it is the rows that I care about here, I'm just going to give those rows names. I will call them W1, W2, and so on and so forth, down to WM. I'm using W to stand for weights, since that's ultimately what I want to show those rows supply. All right, so our actors are on the stage. Let's see if they can perform as I claim they will. Will. Now, in trying to establish this row perspective, I can only lean on the two perspectives we already know and have established, the entry perspective and the still more fundamental column perspective. So I might say, gee, I wish those things were columns instead of rows. Maybe I could think of this whole thing as the transpose of something else. Am I so lucky that I could think of it as the transpose of something? Well, maybe, but what is that something? Ooh, look at this thing that we have over in the corner. That's going to give me a hint. When I take the transpose of a product, I get the product of the transposes, but in the reverse order. So that means the product whose transpose would be this would be, well, let's see, the first factor would have to be R transpose, because the transpose of R transpose is, of course, R, and that's going to end up on the right instead of the left. And the second factor, well, that would have to be the transpose of this matrix. So that would be this guy. 
the matrix whose columns are W1, W2, all the way down to WM. This equal sign is justified by this fact about the transpose of a product, especially if we read it right to left. Transposing this product would give us the transpose of this matrix, which is that, times the transpose of this matrix, which is that. Pretty sneaky, eh? But why on earth would we do something like that, even if this is true? Well, look what we've got inside those brackets. I've got a matrix matrix product, but it's a much more familiar one, where I'm thinking about the columns of the one on the right, as opposed to the rows of the one on the left. And that makes me think of the good old-fashioned column perspective on matrix multiplication. What is the column perspective going to tell us about this product inside of these brackets? Well, it tells us that all that stuff is going to be the matrix whose ith column, or i could be anything, of course, is a linear combination of R transposes columns, where the weights in that linear combination are the entries of wi, the ith column in the right matrix, right? So this equal sign is justified by the column perspective on matrix matrix multiplication. Maybe while I'm writing justifications down, I should indicate that that first equal sign was justified by that property of transposes that we mentioned earlier. Okay, but back to where we were. Why does this help? I have this verbal description of what this product looks like, and then I'm taking its transpose. So when I take the transpose of this matrix I'm describing here, it turns its column into rows. So the transpose of this matrix I've described would be the matrix whose ith row, as opposed to column, is a linear combination of R transposes columns. But wait a second, R transposes columns are the same thing as R's rows. Aha! Where the weights are the entries of WI. So all that follows simply by the definition of the transpose. And look, we're done. We have established what we were trying to, because look at the two things we have connected with equal signs. On the one hand, we have a matrix product where we've got a matrix on the right and a matrix on the left whose rows we are specifically interested in. And we're saying that that product is equal to a matrix whose ith row, so we're interested again here in it row by row, is a linear combination of the rows of R where the weights attached to those rows are the entries of WI, the ith row on the left. That is the row perspective. And now we see why it holds with a little help from the transpose. So I hope this unexpected little jaunt into the territory of transposes and the row perspective on matrix multiplication has given you some further insight, not only into the specific task at hand, why row operations can be carried out through left multiplication by elementary matrices, but also some insight into why all of these different perspectives, and again, not just on matrix multiplication, but on anything in linear algebra, really in mathematics as a whole, well, hell, on life as a whole, are important things for you to be able to shift amongst in your mind. All right, we covered a lot of ground in this video, and now you know how to compute determinants using row reduction. As I said before, I will leave it to you to read the section in the book about computing determinants by cofactor expansion. And the next time I am holding forth to you about linear algebra, we will be moving into chapter six. So until then, good. Bye.